Uh, this is Phil Leach, and in these next three uh, videos, we're going to be exploring figures of speech. Figures of speech are a normal and natural part of our language, and they bring colour, life, and feeling to our written and spoken language. Yet, if wrongly understood, they can lead to miscommunication and misunderstanding. Being able to recognise a figure of speech and understand how it works is an important part of uh, the interpretation of scripture, as, indeed, with any other literature. In his book titled Figures of Speech Used in the Bible, Explained and Illustrated, E.W. Bullinger identifies 217 different figures of speech, some of which have 30 or 40 variations in about 8,000 instances in Scripture. No, we're not going to study this area in this kind of depth, but rather I want to introduce you to some of the common, the most common figures of speech and how they work. I do commend Bullinger's book as a good study companion when you are more familiar with the Bible study process. For some, you may find this session a little technical, but please be patient. Do your best to identify and understand each of these figures of speech as you're able. And as we proceed in our studies, you will quickly learn how to observe them and they will become familiar to you. A figure of speech is a literary device in which words are used out of their literal sense in order to suggest a, a picture or an image. Identifying and understanding figures of speech is simply seeking to identify the author's intended meaning, which, of course, is one of the goals of inductive study. On the screen, there are a couple of examples of uh, quite well-known figures of speech. We should note that each figure of speech uh, should not be understood to be in some water watertight compartment, but there are at times an overlap on the types of figures and their usage. Okay. Let's explore some figures of speech, and we'll begin with an, an analogy. An analogy is where there is a comparison showing points of similarity. For example, a common analogy is made between a heart and a pump. In the Bible, we often see an analogy between God, who is a shepherd, and his people, that are the sheep. In John 15, 1 to 9, we have the well known analogy of Jesus being the vine and the believers being the branches. Analogy Comparison showing points of similarity. Anthropomorphism Anthropomorphism is when human form and attributes are assigned to God. For example, in Psalm 10, 12, God is entreated to lift up your hand, while in Psalm 44, 3, the victory is not of human doing, but by the right hand and arm of the Lord. In Psalm 33:18, it speaks about the eye of the Lord, that is, on those who fear him. And in Genesis 19:29, we read the comforting words that God remembered Abraham during the judgment of, so of Sodom. Certainly, this is an anthropomorphism. anthropomorphism. Because, of course, God doesn't forget. And so, anthropomorphism. Human form and attributes assigned to God.
Apostrophe. Apostrophe, when used in the context of figures of speech, refers to addressing some absent or non-existent person or thing as if present and capable of understanding. It is addressing or speaking to things, abstract ideas or imaginary objects. Hello darkness, my old friend I've come to talk with you again Here Paul Simon talks to darkness, his old friend. Thousands of years before Paul Simon, Moses used this device in his hit song. In Deuteronomy 32.1, where he sings, Give ear, O heaven, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. In Psalm 114, we have some very humorous ex and, and vivid examples of this device, where the Red Sea looks and flees, and mountains skip like rams. And in 1 Corinthians 15.55, the Apostle brings this glorious chapter on the resurrection to a close, looking death straight in the eye and demands, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? And so, apostrophe, addressing some absent or non-existent person or thing as if present and capable of understanding. This is a fun one, a euphemism. A euphemism, which is from the Greek meaning use of good words, is when an expression that may offend or suggest something unpleasant to the receiver is changed to an agreeable or less offensive expression. We are very familiar with this today in many of our cultures where the toilet becomes the bathroom or the restroom, the loo or the outhouse. In public life, we may prefer to talk about someone who is obese as a big boned. Industrial action is uh, used for the term of a strike or misspoken when someone lies or lukewarm for someone who is half-hearted. In the Bible, uh, we read Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 that Adam knew his wife, which is an insightful euphemism for having sex. And in Genesis 15.15, 15, Abraham would go to his father's a euphemism for death. In Judges 3.24, King Eglon was said to be covering his feet, a polite way of saying using the toilet. And in Acts 2.39, we read that the promise was to all who are afar off, avoiding the uh, potentially offensive word, Gentiles. Euphemism, an expression that may offend or suggest something unpleasant, is changed to an agreeable or less offensive expression.